지금 보시는 것들은 항생제 속에서 성장하고 있는 박테리아들입니다 원래 박테리아들은 항생제 속에서 성장할 수가 없죠 하지만 돌연변이가 발생하면 항생제에서도 생존할 수 있게 됩니다 돌연변이가 발생하고 또 발생하고 계속해서 발생하여 처음 항생제 농도의 10배, 100배 더 나아가서 실험을 시작한 지 11일에 진화 끝에 처음에 1000배가 넘는 농도 속에서도 살아남게 됩니다 여러분들은 지금 실시간으로 진화를 보고 있는 것이죠 I'm off to Michigan to see the world's longest running evolution experiment. Let's go. Richard l e n s k 교수님을 만나보죠. 무려 33년 동안 대학원생들과 함께 주말에도 한 가지 실험을 계속하고 계시는 분입니다. 이 실험실에는 살아있는 대장균이 12개의 플라스크에 담겨 있습니다. 이 대장균들은 이 실험실에서 무려 30년간 끊임없이 진화하며 살아남은 운 좋은 녀석들입니다. So there are 12 long term lines. 1988년 하나의 공통조상으로부터 12개의 개체군으로 증식 분열되었습니다. 그리고 그 이후로 각 개체군들은 독립적으로 증식되고 배양되어 어떻게 진화됐을까요? 이렇게 오랜 기간 동안 관찰해야 하는 실험들은 1896년부터 미국의 여러 대학교에서 꾸준히 진행되었습니다. 일리노이 대학에서는 옥수수를 가지고 실험을 했는데 1년에 한 세대만 자랄 수 있죠. 하지만 박테리아는 하루에도 6에서 7세대까지 나올 수 있다는 장점이 있습니다. 33년 동안 렌스키 플라스크에 있는 박테리아는 74,500번째 세대가 되었고 이는 인류 진화에서 150만 년이 지났다는 것을 나타냅니다. What we do to start the experiment is we dilute a, a large population of bacteria onto a petri dish and each individual cell makes a colony. And so then we take a little bit from one colony to start one population, a little bit from another colony to start another population. But effectively, they all started from individual cells. And that's important because it means if we see the same thing happening in replicate populations, it's not because they started out with the same genetic variants and natural selection just fished out the same thing over and over you actually had to have independent mutations that would give rise to these competitive advantages whatever it might be that would produce the repeatability across the the 12 replicate populations 실험실 환경은 박테리아가 보통 있는 환경과 매우 다릅니다. 훨씬 더 간단하죠. 다른 유기체가 존재하지도 않고 37도로 유지되며 포도당, 인산칼륨, 구연삼륜과 같은 물질들이 섞인 용액에서 배양되죠. 대장균의 유일한 탄소 공급원은 포도당인데 제한되어 있습니다. Above all else, consuming that glucose and converting it to offspring, replicating as fast as possible, has been essentially what we seem to be selecting for. 매일 각 플라스크에서는 박테리아가 6번에서 7번 분열되어 100배 정도 증가하게 됩니다. 박테리아 분열 수가 시간에 따라 정해질 것이라 생각하기 쉽지만 사실 박테리아가 있는 환경에 존재하는 자원에 의해 결정됩니다. 박테리아가 사는 용액이 10배 더 짙은 농도였다면 아마 10배 더 개체 수를 늘릴 수 있을 것입니다. 그리고 33년간 거의 매일 이런 과정을 거쳤죠. 박테리아가 배양된 각 플라스크 속 용액의 1%를 동일한 용액으로 구성된 새로운 플라스크로 옮깁니다. 박테리아를 100배 다시 희석시키는 셈인 거죠. 이 과정을 통해 박테리아들에게 하루 동안 성장하고 분열해서 개체수를 100배 늘릴 수 있는 공간과 자원을 제공하는 것입니다. 이 과정은 다음 날과 그 다음 날 심지어 주말에도 30년 넘게 지속되었습니다. 그렇다면 새로운 플라스크로 옮겨지지 못한 99%의 박테리아들은 어떻게 될까요? That's the autoclave room. What happens in the autoclave room? Every day, 99% of the E. coli meet their demise in this horrible room. Is this like a bacterial crematorium? Yeah, yeah, exactly. 과학자들이 만약 이렇게 하지 않고 매일같이 박테리아에게 100배나 되는 용액을 줬다면 실험을 통제할 수 없게 됩니다. 2일차가 되는 날에는 1 세제곱미터의 용액이 필요하지만 13일차에는 용액의 부피가 지구 부피의 10배가 되는 양이 필요해지고 42일째는 
관측 가능한 우주 전체를 채워버리게 될 만큼 박테리아가 많아질 겁니다. To me, it seems like the whole idea of genetics is for them to stay constant and for mutations to be rare. Yes. Yet in your experiment, it seems they're not rare. So we estimate that in our bacteria, only about one out of maybe a hundred or one out of a thousand cells will have even a single mutation. So that's not very much. By contrast, in humans, it's estimated that each one of our offspring has perhaps 10, 20, 50 new mutations. So the bacteria are extremely conservative, but there are also billions of them in even a tiny flask. 만약 우리가 수천 개의 돌연변이와 수십억 개의 개체수를 가진다면 아무래도 우리는 플라스크 안에서 매일 수백만 개의 새로운 돌연변이를 만날 수밖에 없죠. 자연 선택이 어떻게 작용할지에 대해서 수많은 변형이 생기게 되는 것입니다. 아마 돌연변이 중 절반은 이런 특별한 환경에서 증식하는 능력에 전혀 영향을 주지 않을 수도 있습니다. 실험실 밖에서는 이러한 박테리아들이 도움이 될수 있겠지만 실험실 안에서는 아닐 것입니다. 뭐 돌연변이 중 나머지 절반은 좀 해로운 돌연변이들이 있을 수 있을 것입니다. 하지만 이렇게 매일 발생하는 정말 많은 돌연변이들 중에 10개 또는 100개 또는 1000개 정도는 세포 내의 무언가를 바꿔 생존 견쟁에서 우위를 차지할 수 있는 것들이겠죠. 그리고 이런 돌연변이들은 계속해서 분열할 것입니다. 매일 99%가 사라지지만 운 좋은 1%는 남고 계속해서 남아 점점 더 빠르게 증식할 수 있는 박테리아들이 플라스크 속에서도 생존할 확률이 계속해서 증가할 것입니다. 그리고 이것은 계속해서 기하급수적으로 늘어나겠죠. So the mutations, you know, are really rare when they first occur, and many of them are lost. But once they get common, if they have that competitive advantage, they'll just sweep through the population. 하지만 돌연변이 개체들이 환경에 더잘 적응할 수 있다는 것을 어떻게 알수 있을까요? 이런 부분에서 박테리아가 가지고 있는 독특한 특성 중 하나가 도움이 됩니다. 바로 오랜 시간 동안 냉동되었다가도 다시 살아날 수 있다는 거죠. And so they're stored in suspended animation here. So these are the racks that contain the frozen samples of the bacteria from the various generations. 매 500세대마다 인간의 시간으로는 대략 75일마다 렌스키 교수님의 연구실은 각 개체군을 얼립니다. 따라서 기록을 남겨 놓는 거죠. So our samples from over 30 years ago remain perfectly viable. And so that gives us an ability to do what I like to call time travel. We can literally compare organisms that lived at different points in time. So we can compete bacteria from generation 70,000 against their ancestor. 한마디로 말해서 연구자들이 박테리아의 적응도를 측정할 수 있는 방법은 현재 세대의 박테리아와 그 이전 세대의 박테리아를 경쟁시키는 것입니다. 연구원들은 조상 세대들을 녹인 후 현재 세대가 거주하는 플라스크에 섞은 다음 먹이 용액이 담긴 플라스크에 주입하여 두 세대 개체의 수의 상대적인 풍요도를 확인했습니다. 플라스크를 하루 동안 배양한 다음 다시 접시에 담아 성장률을 비교하는 것입니다. 어떤 세대가 포도당을 더잘 활용하여 더 빨리 분열할 수 있는지 확인하는 거죠. Well, how the heck do you tell an evolved bacterium from its ancestor? Do they say, wave little flags at you and say, hey, I'm the evolved guy? And of course they don't. Uh, but what we have is this color marker in the, embedded in the experiment. So six of our populations on a certain kind of auger plate make red colonies and six of them make white colonies. And we have one of version of the ancestor that makes red colonies and one that makes white colonies. We can compete one of the red evolved populations against the white ancestor or one of the white evolved populations against the red ancestor and we can distinguish them. 지금 보이시는 화면에는 붉은 개체군이 흰색 군집파 조상 세대를 능가했다는 것이 보이네요. 우리의 심판 대역원생들이 모든 군집들을 손으로 셉니다. So what was the earliest sort of big findings from the experiment? The first thing we found, not that there was any doubt about it, but it's one of the most direct demonstrations of Darwinian adaptation by natural selection you can imagine. Yes, they're getting to be better competitors over time. It's, it's a common observation in other evolution experiments that evolution in a new environment gets off to a rip-roaring start and then tends to slow down over time. 
And so we repeated that observation and I imagined that the long-term lines would actually sort of flatline at some point. And I actually thought about stopping the experiment, but I got wise advice from colleagues and from my wife Madeline, let's keep it going and so I agreed to that. 렌스케 교수님이 계속한 것은 행운이었습니다. 2003년 박테리아들은 놀라운 일들을 시작합니다. One of the 12 lineages suddenly began to consume a second carbon source, citrate, which had been present in our medium throughout the experiment. It's in the medium as what's called a chelating agent to bind metals uh, in the medium. But E. coli, going back to its original definition as a species, is incapable of that. But one day we found one of our flasks had more turbidity. I thought we probably had a contaminant in there. Some bacterium had gotten in there that could eat the citrate and therefore had, had raised the turbidity. Uh, we, we went back into the freezer and restarted evolution. We also started checking those bacteria to see whether they really were E. coli. Yep, they were E. coli. Were they really E. coli that had come from the ancestral strain? Yep. So we started doing genetics on it. It was very clear that one of our bacteria lineages had essentially I like to say sort of woken up one day, eaten the glucose, and unlike any of the other lineages, discovered that there was this nice lemony dessert. And they had begun consuming that and getting a second source of carbon and energy. Zach was interested in the question of, well, why did it take so long to evolve this? And why has only one population evolved that ability? He went into the freezer and he picked bacterial individuals or clones from that lineage that eventually evolved that ability. And then he tried to evolve that ability again, starting from different points. So in a sense, it's almost like, well, it's like rewinding the tape and starting, well, let's go back to the minute five of the movie. Let's go back to minute 10 of the movie, minute 20 of the movie, and see if the result changes depending on when we did it. Because this citrate phenotype, there were essentially two competing explanations for why it was so difficult to evolve. evolve. One was that it was just a really rare mutation. It wasn't like one of these just change one letter. It was something where maybe you had to flip a certain segment of DNA and you had to have exactly this breakpoint and exactly that breakpoint, and that was the only way to do it. So it was a rare event, but it could have happened at any point in time. The alternative hypothesis is that, well, what happened was a series of events that made something perfectly ordinary become possible that wasn't possible at the beginning because a mutation would only have this effect once other aspects of the organism had changed. To make a long story short, it turns out it's such a difficult trait to evolve because both of those hypotheses are true. 이 실험은 다른 놀라운 발견들도 밝혀냈습니다. 예를 들면 시간이 지남에 따라 박테리아가 더 많아질 것이라는 예상과는 달리 박테리아 개체 수는 줄었지만 크기가 점점 더 커졌습니다. 12개의 개체 집단 중 6개는 조상보다 100배 더 높은 돌연변이율을 가졌지만 나중에는 돌연변이율을 다시 낮추는 추가적인 돌연변이를 얻게 되었습니다. 돌연변이가 높으면 다른 박테리아들보다 더 빨리 진화할 수 있지만 너무 높게 되면 자손들이 너무 해로운 돌연변이를 많이 가지게 될 수도 있다는 거죠. This view I had that they were flatlining turned out to be quite false. I had sort of imagined a very simple mathematical model. Uh, you can create something called a rectangular hyperbola, I guess, which has a initial high slope and then reaches an asymptote. But they're equally simple models. Uh, there's a model that also has just two parameters called a power law model that says things slow down, but it doesn't have an upper bound. It says just keep going for time immemorial and things will just keep going faster, but a slower and slower rate of further improvement. And it turned out that model actually fits our data better than that original model I had imagined. And not only does it fit it better, Okay, you say statistics, science, you know, fitting curves, it actually predicts the future. And that's what's really cool. Because the original model, if you give it, say, just 5,000 generations worth of our fitness data and ask it to predict into the future, it says the asymptote is here. But then when we get more data, no, the bacteria are up here. They've passed that asymptote. Whereas this power law model, which says things are slowing down but never reaching an asymptote, we give it just one tenth of our data from the past and it projects very accurately out to 50,000 and even 60,000 generations when we last looked. It predicts sort of the future course of the evolutionary trajectory. And to me that's kind of profound and it sort of changed 
the way I look at this experiment and even a little bit how I look at life on Earth. I mean, life on Earth doesn't stop evolving. We know that and we know that, but we think that's, oh, that's because they're asteroid impacts. That's because of human impacts. That's because they're viruses that are attacking their hosts and it, the co-evolution is, evolu is causing evolution to never stop. The world is always changing, so of course evolution never stops. And that is 100% true. But what our experiment suggests is that even in the absence of environmental change, there are so many opportunities of smaller and smaller magnitude to continue to make progress that in fact, progress probably would never stop even in a constant environment. To me, it's one of the reasons to keep this experiment going. Does this model continue to predict the unfolding of the future fitness trajectory?